everybody. This is Nora with Rotational Mono Feeding. Just wanted to talk today a little bit about bile vomiting. I recently, as I often do, uh, just Googled bile vomiting syndrome to see what people were saying about it. I like to stay informed at what, about what vets and others are theorizing about various disease conditions. And this one is so common um, that I thought I would talk a little more about it. Um, we've talked about it a lot in the Facebook group, of course, and I have a blog article that I've written um, about bilious vomiting syndrome, um, including my theory about what causes it. Um, but I wanted to find out what was going on out there in the marketplace, what was being said. So I pulled up an article by Whole Dog Journal, and I thought that would be an interesting place to start. So I'm just going to read the article, and then I'm going to comment on what I think about the information that's being shared. Um, let's see, I'll just read the, the title. Dog throwing up yellow, what you should know about bilious vomiting syndrome. Dogs who frequently vomit a yellowish liquid are said to suffer from bilious vomiting syndrome, which may have an, any number of causes, but fortunately a number of solutions too. I don't think there are a number of solutions. I think there's basically one solution and it, um, it is feeding properly. So the article proceeds with some dogs are prone to vomiting either first thing in the morning or in the wee hours of the night. It's usually just a small amount of vomit, typically yellowish in color and somewhat frothy or foamy, and it's more common in younger dogs. I've always called it empty stomach bile vomiting. Some people call it, I'm commenting now, some people call it hunger pukes because it seems to always happen when dogs are quote unquote hungry. Anyway, continuing with the article, the medically correct name for it is bilious vomiting syndrome. The word bilious comes from the Latin bilis, which means bile, and us, means, which means having or full of. Bile is a fluid that is produced by the liver and secreted into the upper part of the small intestine where it aids digestion. Sometimes, however, bile backs up into the stomach, inflaming the stomach lining. Um, well, it may inflame the stomach lining eventually, but I don't think it ever really gets to that point because I think before that happens, the stomach um, becomes irritated enough to eject it. And this happens more often in younger dogs than older dogs. And hopefully I'll get around to explaining that a little later in the article. But it goes on to say, this all sounds terrible, but to be honest, the worst thing about the term bilious vomiting syndrome is the word syndrome. When medical professionals use the word syndrome, it generally means we have no idea what causes it. If we know what causes a problem, it's a lot easier to prevent and treat. And I would very much agree with that. And that's why I think the medical industry as a whole likes to turn its um, head away from causes and not even look in the direction of possible causes because if we, if everybody collectively knows what causes a problem, then we don't need the medical industry to help us solve it. Um, if misfeeding causes bilious vomiting syndrome, then correct feeding will resolve bilious vomiting syndrome and no medical professional is required to, to fix that situation. So I should say, by the way, that this article is written by a, what we have to assume is a classically trained vet. Um, her name is Dr. Eileen Facherik. Um, the article goes on to say the certain theoretical cause. The certain cause of bilious vomiting syndrome is unknown but veterinary medical science has some theories. The most widely accepted theory is that a combination of decreased stomach motility and a weak sphincter muscle between the stomach and small intestine allows bile from the small intestine to essentially backwash into the stomach and sit there. Bile is supposed to be in the small intestine and it causes no problems there. It is not supposed to be in the stomach. When it is, it's very irritating to the stomach lining, resulting in vomiting. Uh, what I would say about that is that uh, decreased stomach motility and a weak sphincter between the stomach and small intestine may indeed 
contribute to this problem, but I don't think those things cause it because those things also have causes. So those are just concurrent symptoms. They are not causes. As we know, in RMF, you can't have effects causing each other. They might seem to because they flow upstream and downstream from each other, but they don't cause each other. We have to look beyond that. We have to look under that to find the cause of both symptoms and in order to resolve them both. And what I think about, and I was not aware until I read this article that this that decreased stomach motility and a weak sphincter muscle were being theorized by medicine, by veterinary medicine, as a cause of bile vomiting. So they have some solutions that are related to this theory, <coughs> which are problematic, and I'll explain that later on too. But the article goes on to say other causes of vomiting. But because vomiting is a symptom associated with many other conditions, it's important to rule out any underlying diseases before attributing it to bilious vomiting syndrome. The list of differentials for chronic vomiting is long. We'll mention a few here, but this list is not meant to be all-inclusive. And I don't think this list here necessarily relates to bile vomiting. I think this is vomiting in general, but some of these are applicable and some are not. Like Addison's disease would be a concurrent symptom because whatever caused the adrenal glands to be underactive is the same thing that causes um, bile vomiting if the two are related. Cancer is the same thing. Food allergy is not applicable here because most so-called food allergies are caused by foods going into the body that aren't um, biologically appropriate anyway. And if they, even if they seem to be biologically appropriate, it's because there's something wrong with the food. Like chicken, for example, is said to be a common allergen for dogs, but it's not the chicken itself, it's the fat. Chicken is very fatty and it's, it's very um, pervasive in the dog feeding world. Almost everybody feeds chicken and almost nobody trims the fat before they do that. Um, gastric foreign bodies, that is more like an injury. That wouldn't be applicable here, although a dog with, um, uh, with some kind of obstruction or foreign body stuck somewhere will often vomit um, bile. Um, this is really an injury. This doesn't have to do with disease, but that's neither here nor there because this is a list of, of conditions that would, uh, where uh, um, a dog owner might see their dog vomiting bile. So it's legitimate, but it's, that's more like an injury. Um, gastritis, ulcers would be concurrent symptom. Helio, helicobacter is a bacterium thought to cause chronic vomiting. There may be chronic vomiting present, but I guarantee 100% that helicobacter is only there to try and solve the problem. It is absolutely not there causing the vomiting itself. And if you go looking for that, helicobacter and you find it and you kill it, you have not solved the problem. Um, hiatal hernia, I don't know a lot about hernias, but I have to think if they are a chronic condition as opposed to something that a dog is born with, um, then they would be a concurrent symptom too. Same with inflammatory bowel disease, intestinal parasites are just there to feed on waste, pancreatitis is caused by fat in the diet, so that would be a concurrent symptom. Um, Physolopterosis is apparently a stomach worm dogs can get from eating crickets. Uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. I think that's probably a pretty rare thing. I haven't heard of that. Um, that's probably separate. I, think, I don't think that that is a common enough cause of bile vomiting that it truly belongs in this list. Um, and here's another one about slowly moving intestinal foreign bodies. So like I said before, obstructions may cause a dog to vomit bile. But if you see it happening, if you see bile vomiting happening almost every day or regularly, and it's when your dog has an empty stomach, we're, st we're probably talking about simple so-called hunger pukes. So 
next, the article is going to talk about the, um, the tests that are performed by vets to try and figure this issue out. Well, to me, it's a matter of since almost everything else is just a concurrent symptom, except for blockage, if you have some suspicion that your dog might have some kind of foreign body blocking in blocking his intestines or in, um, in it's stuck in his stomach or something, um, then that needs to be ruled out. And the only way that you can do, do that is with medical imaging of some kind. And that might be indicated um, if that's what you suspect. Otherwise, this is going to be about those same underlying conditions um, that I was mentioning before, which have to do with my um, personal theory about bilious vomiting syndrome. So the treatments, uh, once it's been determined that your dog likely suffers from bilious vomiting syndrome, it's time to try to make it better. I reckon this vet recommends changing one thing at a time in case that one simple step will resolve the issue. If one step alone doesn't resolve it, continue and add the next step. The solution might involve a couple or a combination of all the steps. So step one has to do with keeping food in the stomach. So this is very typical advice that people who have this problem will be given. Um, just in, just um, to prevent your dog's stomach being empty all night, um, feed a small meal at bedtime. The problem with feeding a small meal at bedtime is that very often meals will go through the body in less than eight or nine hours, and that means the dog is going to have to poop in the middle of the night. So that's that's not only not a solution to the problem, it might create another problem as well. But the main thing is you don't want to just keep feeding the dog. You don't want to have to keep a dog's stomach working all the time to digest food just to solve this problem when there are other ways to solve it that, by the way, solve all those other disease problems that were on that list as well. So the step number two also has to do with increasing the frequency of feeding. It says divide the dog's daily food allotment into multiple small meals throughout the day. The idea is to stimulate the stomach into continuous motility. Well, the stomach doesn't want to be stimulated constantly. The stomach doesn't want to work continuously. It's not meant to work continuously, particularly in dogs. It is meant to work once, uh, maybe a couple, every two or three days. That's what we see from looking at wolves. The stomach works very hard for, um, for a few hours, for maybe a full day after, after a dog eats, makes a kill and eats. Um, but then the stomach goes into dormancy for a couple of days. And that's what we see when we look into um, the, his the biological history of dogs. It's actually very damaging to have um, a stomach constantly working. So um, if those two steps don't work, the step number three coming from this vet is to add an acid reducer like omeprazole, uh, in other words, Prilosec, um, these drugs, this is a drug, it has side effects, um, and it says right here in this paragraph that the body builds up tolerance to this, um, pepsid, um, which makes it less effective. And what we know about tolerance is that in order for the body to tolerate something, in order for it to produce tolerance, it has to give up some function. Tolerance is always what happens when a body can't do anything else except put up with um, a stimulus, a harmful stimulus. And when it does that, it has to give up something else. It's like when you develop a callus on your hand, that callus will protect you and that's tolerance, but it will also give up the sensitivity of your skin in that, in that area. And the same thing happens to internal organs when you give drugs and when you misfeed. Those tissues have to protect themselves so they get what is called indurated or scarred or thickened. And that's what produces tolerance. But there's a cost that is associated with that. And we need to be aware of the cost. When there are... Um, solutions to 
bile vomiting that involve absolutely no cost, then why are we looking at Prilosec? We don't need to look at Prilosec. Why are we going to a vet to tell us that we need Prilosec? We don't need Prilosec. We just need to figure out how to properly feed our dogs. And here we're going to get into um, some heavier duty medication as step four if the previous three steps didn't solve your problem. And this relates back to the, um, the, the the theory that vets are now having about decreased stomach motility causing bile to back up into the stomach. Um, and this again, what it does is it just stimulates the stomach. It stimulates, um, it increases motility. Motility is just movement. So it increases movement artificially. And it does that through stimulation. And here I use the analogy, the old analogy of um, whipping a tired horse. When a, when a horse is tired, you know, if you carry a whip, I don't, I've, <laughs> I've ridden a horse maybe twice in my whole life, but this apparently works when a, when a horse is tired and you have a whip and you give them a nice sharp whack on the behind, they will run faster. But that's not the horse being able to create energy because the only way to create energy in a horse is to let him rest. That's getting the horse to work harder when their energy is almost working that, wearing out. And that is a dangerous thing to do because the next thing that the horse will have to do because it won't have any choice is it will just drop. It will just um, die, I suppose. So the point is you definitely don't want to keep stimulating an organ that's already shown in itself to be low in function. That's, it's absolutely crazy. And this is going to have problems upstream because the stomach, like the, like the tired horse, will eventually just not want to work at all. And I imagine it would result in a dog eventually just not being able to digest food at all and just having um, a serious vomiting issue. And the last step on the list is asking your vet about a gastroprotectant. And here she mentions a couple of drugs. And what this does is it apparently puts some kind of protective layer or either that or it um, causes the, in, the, um, the lining of the stomach to thicken itself and become less sensitive to bile irritation. But here again, we have the problem of this comes not, it, does, it doesn't come without a cost. There's a cost associated to that. The stomach line, lining is supposed to be sensitive. It's absolutely supposed to be sensitive. It must be sensitive in order to function properly. So these drugs are not the answer. And the final paragraph says, the good news, Billy's vomiting syndrome is considered a benign condition. It must be uncomfortable for your dog, however, and cleaning up vomit every day certainly isn't fun for you. We hope these tips, tips will help you eliminate this unpleasant chronic condition. Um, they might... Um, help prevent the effect, but they're not going to prevent the causes. So I will put some information in the description box about um, the truth about bilious vomiting syndrome and what really causes it, and a link to my uh, blog article that explains that, and a link to um, my book that explains how to properly feed your dogs so that if they are already having this problem, it will resolve itself. And um, if your dog has never had this problem, it won't become a problem at all. Okay, thanks for listening and watching. See you next time. Bye, everybody.